Battleborn, Paladins, Overwatch. Over a year ago, I made a video that provided a brief overview and a loose comparison of each of these games. At the time I made the video, both Overwatch and Battleborn were just about to release, while Paladins was in a closed but still very public beta. Now, both Overwatch and Battleborn have been out for over a year, while Paladins is deep into an open beta. But how are these games doing over a year later? Have they changed or improved? Have they died? Since that video did so much better than I ever anticipated, I thought that this would be a good opportunity to revisit the video and its games that helped launch this channel to the size it is today. I'll be spending a little time with each of these three games as they are today, a year later. I'll be going in the same order as I did before, comparing my experiences with those that I have documented and remember from that time. So let's stop wasting time with all this setup and let's move on to the first game. Battleborn is the odd man out out of this trio, as it's the only game that includes a PvE campaign along with its PvP. It's also the only one of these games that can be classified as a MOBA rather than a competitive hero shooter. Doesn't that mean it shouldn't be compared with the likes of Overwatch and Paladins? Probably, but when I initially went into Battleborn, I didn't even know it would be a MOBA. Chances are, many others wouldn't have either. I mean, it looks very similar to the other two on the surface, right? So at the very least, I wanted to share exactly what Battleborn is and what I thought it did and didn't do well. I had a lot of fun with Battleborn. A MOBA with first-person shooter mechanics isn't something you see very often, and no Paragon or Smite do not fit that bill, and is a fusion that I would like to see survive. I enjoyed it in Super Monday Night Combat, and I enjoy it in Battleborn. It's a unique and fun fusion that isn't seen enough, and I fear that, after Battleborn, it won't be seen again for a long time. Why is that, you may ask? Well, Battleborn is, at this point, a dead game. It was dead only a few months after its release, as a matter of fact. On the day of its release, it saw its all-time high of about 12,000 concurrent players, which is still pretty low for a competitive game meant to have a long lifespan, dropped to about 2,300 only a month later, and by the end of the fourth month, Battleborn's peak concurrent player numbers could not pass three digits. Fast forward a year later and Battleborn spends most of its time in double-digit numbers of concurrent players on Steam, and that's when it finally went free-to-play. At the time of writing this, Battleborn has been in free-to-play for about a week, and during peak hours on a Saturday has failed to attract and maintain an amount of players significant enough to keep it going. And this is peak hours on a Saturday. This is the time where most people would be playing if people were playing it. So why did it die? And why did a free-to-play update fail to revive it? Well, Battleborn's initial death was largely due to a failed marketing campaign. Nobody knew what Battleborn was and why they should care. And on top of that, it attempted to directly compete with Overwatch, which had an insane amount of hype at the time, which completely dwarfed anything that Battleborn could muster. Combine that with the fact that it cost a full $60 retail on launch in a market that is dominated by high-quality free-to-play games, and it's clear to see why it couldn't get off the ground in spite of how much I personally enjoyed it. But what about the initial 12,000 concurrent players? Clearly, they already took the plunge, so why did they leave so quickly? Well, here's a rapid-fire list of reasons. Optimization issues on launch, long-term balancing issues, poor user experience that includes a lack of information conveyance, incredibly short and repetitive campaign, cluttered and visually abrasive visuals, a baffling method of unlocking characters, poor marketing, terrible response time on game issues, a dwindling player base causing a snowball of frustration for players in matchmaking pools, an introduction of a poorly conceived cash shop, an already split community between PvE and PvP, and so many more reasons. It's a lot of reasons, and they add up very quickly into an experience that's just not fun to deal with. But in spite of that quick decline I cited earlier, Gearbox continued to release DLC and patches and news and stuff like that, presumably as an obligation they felt that they had to their players after selling them a season pass. But what about after all that? Surely removing the price to entry would attract tens of thousands of players almost immediately. I mean, look what happened to Evolve! From 234 concurrent players to 51,000, basically in an instant. 
Some sources even say that it was over a million new players that tried the game. I mean, sure, Evolve couldn't maintain it, but at least people tried it. But no, nah, not even close. No more than 1,600 players were logged into Battleborn at its peak on Steam after the free-to-play transition. This is likely because of two reasons. First, the game's transition wasn't announced beforehand, so nobody knew until news outlets reported on it. Evolve didn't do that either, but I imagine that giving this news a week to stew would have helped a lot. Second, and perhaps more importantly, free-to-play isn't what this is being sold as. They're calling it a free trial. The reasoning for this is because you don't get the PvE stuff, but come on. The entirety of the MOBA experience that Battleborn has to offer is included in this so-called free trial in a way that's not really any fundamentally different from any other free-to-play MOBA on the market. Regardless, free trial does not carry the same connotation or expectation as outright calling it free-to-play, which Gearbox refuses to do. Apparently, it also doesn't carry the same amount of new players as free-to-play, if the Steam charts are anything to go by. Really, I just feel like Gearbox and 2K have little to no working market knowledge of the genre they tried to break into with Battleborn and, because of that, failed to give players what they really wanted. It seems that, perhaps, there was a little bit of overconfidence on their part, thinking that because Borderlands did well, that Battleborn would do well, since it's full of that same Borderlands charm. Hopefully they learned a lesson. It really is too bad, though, because despite how you might feel about Gearbox and Randy Pitchford himself for their recent terrible games and terrible marketing strategies, Battleborn was and still is a pretty fun and unique experience. They added the ability to play the PvP games with incredibly stupid bots, but I have to say that I was having a pretty good time even playing against them. But unfortunately, that fun can't last more than a couple of hours just because of how stupid the bots are. With such a small player base, you're mostly limited to a solo experience. Even as a functionally free-to-play title, it's hard for me to recommend giving Battleborn a try at all. There just aren't enough players, even after the transition to free-to-play, to find good, consistent matches. But hey, if you and some friends can pick up some keys to unlock the full game for about five bucks, going through the campaign experience together could be a pretty good time. But if that's what you're looking for, you're probably better off with something like Warhammer Vermintide instead. Looks like we're just going to have to wait a little longer for a hybrid FPS MOBA to succeed. Oh boy, here we go. Paladins, the game that people love to throw insults at me over till this day. The game that I was incredibly harsh on a year ago and very critical of in my review of it when it transitioned to open beta. When I did my segment on Paladins over a year ago, the game had just entered an awkward transitional phase as it was changing from a slow, strategic point control shooter with level ups and huge maps to a faster paced and more arena style team shooter with customization elements and smaller maps. In other words, that video was made during the game's puberty. During that time, Paladins was a bit of a mess. There was one map and it was overly large and uninspired with a lack of cohesion in its design. The recent drastic change in the way the card system worked resulted in a very poorly balanced experience, and both of these together made the gameplay feel like something was fundamentally wrong with the game. As if it was coded by a bunch of freshly out of college amateurs rather than the established studio that High res is. Fast forward about six months and the game had seen massive shifts in design and gameplay such that it didn't even feel like the same game. The giant, ugly open map was gone and replaced with a handful of smaller, perfectly symmetrical maps in a capture-then-push style of gameplay. This is when I decided to revisit Paladins, and overall I found the experience much more enjoyable than I did six months prior. I took some issue with the aesthetics and sound design, critiqued the improved maps, and went over some changes that the game had seen. While I couldn't see myself enjoying the game long term, I concluded that the game was pretty alright and worth trying out to see if you like it yourself. Although based on the dislike bar and some of the awful comments I've received on that very video, you'd think I was trying to incite a hate mob towards High res Studios or something. But I digress. It's now been another eight or nine months, and the first thing I noticed when diving back into the game is that this time it feels like the same game. This is a good thing. There have been a few new modes added, including a true payload mode, a survival mode, and a PvE mode that seems to have been removed before I got a chance to play it. And the card concept has been refined and expanded to include a new type of card. 
legendary cards that significantly alter the focus of a character's moveset. This includes things like adding an effect to one of your abilities, changing the way an ability's cooldown functions, or even something as simple as a large stat increase. One thing that I harped on in my Revisiting Paladins video was the fact that many of the abilities at the time had what I called fake synergies, where a character's moveset interacted with itself. For example, Cassie's first shot after using her dodge roll ability does 50% increased damage. I hated this, because rather than using a move just because it was the right thing to do at the time, it turned into an order of operations that you had to memorize for each ability. This seems to have been completely removed now, with some of these thrown into the card system. This is good, because now if you don't want to play with that order of operations, you don't have to. And if you prefer it, it's there. More options is always a good thing. Additionally, the game now includes quests to help you earn gold, many new champions with many more on the way, and a massive amount of new customization options for all the champions. If you love to customize your favorite characters, Paladins has a lot for you, since you can mix and match all of them to suit your style. Aesthetically, I don't feel like the game has improved a whole lot. Maps still feel kind of dull with unsaturated colors, but the inclusion of the payload mode means that perfectly symmetrical maps aren't the only thing available anymore. Character design along with the map design still feels like it lacks a real sense of cohesion and focus, and nothing really feels like it belongs in the world, making it still feel like a, you know what would be cool, kind of design philosophy. Animations are still lacking in weight, and the sound design, while marginally better, still seems to lack some of that oomph. Overall, I still think the game is fun and worth a try, but it's still not for me. Personally, I find the card system in this game kind of boring and annoying to deal with. The cards may be impactful, but they don't feel impactful. Some percentage increase of damage or small amount of cooldown reduction or extra air control are not particularly fun to micromanage or theorycraft for, at least in my opinion. The same thing applies to the item system in Battleborn and the rune pages and talent systems of League of Legends. All of them are meant to give you some level of customization for your characters outside of a match, but more often than not, they're mostly intangible and unexciting benefits. Further, they hinder one of the major advantages of designing a class or hero-based game, the ability to know the capabilities of whatever you're facing off against at a glance. A character's silhouette carries a lot of information attached to it, and this level of customization introduces some guesswork into that process but I do understand that this system is part of what people love about Paladins, and at this point in the game's lifespan, I'm sure it's here to stay. Something I'll admit in this video while we're talking about Paladins is that in the original video I fired shots at High Res's CEO, Eris Gorin, using evidence gathered from anonymous sources on Glassdoor and corroborated by an anonymous employee directly. This was a misguided attempt at justifying the horrible state of the game and the seemingly knee-jerk changes that I was experiencing in the game at that time, and an attempt to illustrate that the game may not ever be stable. However, it was a pretty unwarranted attack on my part. Let's let the game speak for itself. After all, Hi-Rez does have a proven track record of fun games, regardless of the truth or untruth of those allegations. At the end of the day, Paladins is a pretty good game. It's reasonably fun, and it has a very healthy player base that'll likely stick around for quite a while. In its current state, it's easy to recommend if you're looking for a shooter to play, especially since it's free. So if you haven't already, go give it a try. I've been called a Blizzard fanboy in more ways than I can remember by this point, and that's due in part by my lambasting of Paladins over the past years and my own admission that I've loved Blizzard's games since all the way back to Warcraft 1. I was also a huge fan of Hi-Rez Studios by the time Paladins had come out, having spent hundreds and hundreds of hours in both Global Agenda and Smite, with Global Agenda still carrying some of my fondest memories when it comes to first-person shooters and Smite being the first MOBA that really sucked me off, I, I mean sucked me in. So with Global Agenda 2 having been cancelled and turned into Paladins and my general appreciation for Blizzard's games having been verbalized and the large amount of praise that I dumped all over Overwatch, many fans thought I was nothing more than a biased fanboy with a vendetta or something. Some people accused me of being bought off by Blizzard. Others accused me of trying to get revenge on high res for cancelling Global Agenda 2. Some thought it was just raw fanaticism of Blizzard that led me to hate everything that isn't created by them. None of these are true, 
I had less than 400 subscribers at the time I released the video with no way of knowing that it would have blown up like it did. I just had an opinion and I wanted to share it. And I still stand by those opinions. At the time, I was completely enamored with the game. Every moment that I wasn't at work or working on one of these videos, I was playing Overwatch. And it hit that perfect sweet spot of what I wanted in a game at that time. Have you ever had a game like that that lands in that perfect spot when you're craving that specific kind of game? For me, Overwatch landed in that spot and I truly found nothing bad to say about it. I stopped playing so much at around the time Anna was released in July 2016, and since then, I've spent a significant amount of time away from the game. In addition to Anna, there have only been two other new heroes, Sombra and Orisa, as well as two new maps, Eichenwald and Oasis. That's pretty much it. On a more structural side, the game has gotten rid of the weekly brawl in lieu of an arcade mode for wild and crazy stuff, as well as a myriad of non-standard custom game types like 3v3 and 1v1 elimination modes, both of which share a unique map pool of smaller maps, and capture the flag. There's also now a seasonal competitive mode to participate in if that's your thing. As far as new content goes, that's pretty much it unless you want to count the one-off seasonal content that goes away like Junkenstein's Brawl, which was a PvE-oriented horde mode that was a lot more fun than I expected it to be. It's not a lot of new content, not by any stretch of the imagination. Even ba- <laughs> Even ba- <laughs> Even Battleborn got more content, and it's dead! And Paladins has practically doubled its number of heroes. But I will say, even with barely any new content, jumping back into Overwatch after having not played it at all for approximately nine months is pretty hard. Everybody got better at shooting while I got 100% in Hollow Knight. It's not really a fair fight anymore. Add to that the two new characters that I don't really know anything about and a metagame that shifted so far out of what I knew almost a year ago, and I'm realizing that Overwatch is a far more daunting game to experience as a newbie than I gave it credit for. Plus, it seems that if you want a more fair match as a less skilled player, you're stuck with the competitive mode or one of the weird arcade modes. It might just be because of coming back after a long hiatus, but I felt completely outclassed in every quick match game I've played since starting up again. But I wouldn't really call that a real criticism, because every game can be overwhelming from the start, and I still can't really find anything specific to critique about the game. So at least let's do a little rapid fire back and forth of some of the common complaints that I've heard about Overwatch. The maps have too many choke points! This might be a negative to some people, but these maps are deliberately designed with these choke points in mind. This kind of map design encourages conflict in a very specifically controlled fashion. It encourages a balanced team composition such that you have to have a solid front line, a dangerous back line, and flankers to cause chaos. It feels good to hold a point or to finally break that choke, and the encounters often feel epic and drawn out. The maps are pretty clearly designed around points of conflict. And if there were any less chokes or any more flanking paths, the points would be broken much more easily and class balance would be changed entirely as a result. Bastion and Symmetra are overpowered! Uh, I try not to talk too much about class balance in these videos, because uh, these things change from patch to patch. While, while getting murdered by a Bastion is your own dang fault, I will concede that it never feels good to melt to a Symmetra's left mouse click skill beam or to get hooked by a roadhog and murdered. Microtransactions are greedy in a paid game! This is a very divisive subject, but I stand firmly on the line of I don't care that you can buy loot crates. Can a Blizzard get along okay without it? Yeah, probably. But as long as it doesn't change the gameplay and doesn't divide the player base, I don't care. This is just an optional way to support Blizzard further if you desire, and get something in return that could just be acquired by just playing the game a lot. There's no progression! Good! This is a thing that really bothers me about Paladins and Battleborn. It's a trend that's just been g getting out of hand over the past few years. Personally, I prefer to know exactly what I'm up against and exactly what that character is capable of when I see its silhouette. Adding metagame progression and skill customization just gunks up that familiarity. This is what I meant when I said it's a pure shooter in my previous video. Each character is just that character. Period. That purity means it's a precisely crafted experience and a better tuned balance overall. You're just mad because you spent money on Overwatch and Paladins is free and better. <laughs> of 
people are really si Ugh. Oh my, oh my god, they are. What the f- Overwatch costs money! Well, I, I guess that's a better complaint. I don't have any counterstatement to that, I just know that it doesn't bother me. I got my money's worth, and I've spent more on games I've played less. That's just how games work sometimes, and if you can't afford it for some reason, well, that's fine too. If that's stopping you, that's your prerogative. Out of these three games, Overwatch still stands high with the best polish, the most character, the most visual appeal, and the tightest design. I mentioned in my last video how the cohesiveness of the character and world design stitches together the fabric of the game's universe, and it stands tall and true today. Brought down a little only by the fact that the team versus team combat and team composition makes little to no sense in the game's lore. Like, why are Tracer and Winston fighting? And why is Tracer on both teams? What's going on? Battleborn is also very strong in this department and might have even done better if the game hadn't been forgotten about like that basket of fresh strawberries in the back of your fridge that you bought months ago because you thought it would be a good idea but then it got hidden by other things and oh god, I'll be right back. Ah, gross! While it's definitely true that Overwatch hasn't had much content added to the core experience, this is something that's actually pretty typical of shooters. However, shooters of the past, especially those out of Valve Studio, have had many options to customize the game. I'm talking about custom servers with user-created maps and custom scripts that alter the gameplay in a significant way to create a game within the game. Counter-Strike had RPG mods and jump puzzles, for instance, and Team Fortress 2 had so many incredible user-created maps that elevated the experience. That's not even to mention Quake in all of its various modes. Freeze Tag was my favorite when I was growing up. But for some reason, Blizzard seems really against this kind of open platform for the game, and that's probably the most disappointing thing about Overwatch as a whole. It sucks that we won't be able to see the community's creativity shine through modifications or custom maps, and that's sad. I'm sure there are hundreds of folks itching for a map editor so they can dig in and create. So, outside of that little fact, even though I rarely play it anymore, Overwatch is still the winner for me, personally. Is it perfect? No, no game is, and just because I personally can't find anything to dislike about it doesn't mean that I imply it as such. It's just a very solidly put together game with a level of care and polish that's apparent that simply doesn't exist in the other two games. But hey, that's just me and the way my own mind works. I want to conclude this video with one final statement. I've had a lot of complaints that I was comparing a AAA buy-to-play title from a giant like Blizzard late in its development cycle to a AA free-to-play game from a smaller studio with a limited budget earlier in its development cycle, with some specific umbrage taken at the video's title, which one should you buy even though Paladins is free? But listen, does any of that really matter? Time and attention are a precious commodity in today's fast-paced lifestyle. What you're not buying with money you're paying for in information or time. Paladins may be free to play and still in beta, but the time we have to spend is limited. And regardless of who made a game or where it came from or what phase of development it's in, the only metric that truly matters in whether or not that time and optionally money was well spent is in how much fun the game is. Time is money, friends. Look, at the end of the day, big budget titles can fail. Small budget titles can exceed all expectation. Indie versus AAA, beta versus full release. None of that matters in the moment. All that matters is, are you having fun? Thanks so much for coming with me on this journey and choosing to spend your time here. Revisiting these games was an interesting experience to say the least. Anyway, please be sure to leave your thoughts and opinions in the comment section below, and if you liked the video or disliked it, you know what to do. If you want some more hero shooter goodness, check out my video on the upcoming Lawbreakers. It's fast, it's science fiction, and it's got anti-gravity. What else could you want? Or check out my video on Gigantic, a highly stylistic MOBA that's in beta on the Windows Store and Xbox One now, and coming soon to PC. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at IngeniousClown and hit that subscribe button for more awesome gaming content here in the future, and I will see you next time.